Hi, welcome everybody. It's Patricia Albert, and it's May 1st, and we're going to have a conversation about for realness, being for real, and particularly, um, we're going to start looking at it from the area. I mean, there's always the personal, you know, whether somebody's personally for real, but we sort of want to take the angle of looking at it from a cultural standpoint of how the culture that we're in is shaping a certain lack of um, for realness that, that I think most of us are experiencing in society and that, you know, we may start to see in ourselves as the conversation goes on. Uh, who I'm going to be speaking with is a brilliant uh, award-winning journalist, Danny Katz, and who has a passion for this, this topic as well. <laughs> so, um, you know, she, she's going to ask me questions and we're going to have a dialogue and, and we definitely invite you to call in and ask questions as well as we, you know, illuminate, um, you know, an area that I think is sometimes we wonder about, you know, and we wonder about it. it it's discouraging when we find that in our relationships, I think in particular, but, but also in business and, and in other things, you know, that people aren't solid or substantial or you can't count on them or what they have to say doesn't mean anything or they're, you know, totally in love with you, you know, and then they never call you again. You know, I mean, there's, you know, those, those elements of not being able to count on each other. So I want to welcome Danny. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah. And so we'll just start in. Well, um, I know this topic has been uh, up and we decided to do this show a couple weeks ago. So I have been curious as to how we're defining for realness and what, what that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, there's probably different angles you could look at it. So we'll just, we'll just sort of, we can both look at, you know, what's the definition. Uh, for me, it's with people a quality where there's there's continuity. If somebody says that they are going to do something or that they feel a certain way or they are committed to something or they're passionate about something, that it isn't just a momentary thing. That it so actually it's follow through. Yeah, it 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 lasts over time. It's not just a momentary, you know, feel, feeling of inspiration. Um, you know, I know one of the things we talked about was, you know, there are times, and especially as a teacher too, you know, you have people and they're just so excited and they're, you know, can't wait to do whatever it is and this, that, and the other thing. And then it, it translates into nothing. You know, within, within a week, it doesn't mean anything. Right. And I, I know as a woman, you know, I mean, just from a personal standpoint, you know, when I was, you know, more in the dating scene, you know, same thing. You can have some like, you know, super inspirational, you know, somebody's just crazy about you, but it doesn't mean anything. I mean, there's no lastingness. And so people, it seems like people don't know the difference between a real intention, a real commitment, a real something that is a real emotion as opposed to just sort of you know, having something move through them momentarily, like a cloud passes over. Yeah, it feels like you're talking about a certain, like, um, impetuous or impulsive quality where there's an enthusiasm that we connect with in the moment and then make promises based on some momentary inspiration without really checking in to see if we can follow through, if we're aligned, follow, you know, take it a few steps further into the future to see if that's right for us. And I think that, right. I think that's really reflected in our relationships. Like that's sort of what's become of, will you marry me? It's like this impetuous excitement in the moment because we're feeling something without mm -hmm. really leaping forward to translate that into till death does us part. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, definitely. And it, there's a, I mean, there's obviously some tendencies that we can look at just personally within ourselves of, I would say that it's an era of self-knowledge one point, you know, like not like the way you were saying it, like knowing yourself and knowing, okay, I get excited about things. You know, I'm that kind of person, right. but I, but knowing yourself well enough to not make any promises or not to take any serious action so that you're not, you know, leading somebody to believe something that's not, that you can't um, be responsible for. I think that's a piece of it. And I think it also comes down to us not really grokking the value of our words and what we say. 
So a lot of people will say something as simple as I'll call you tomorrow and right. n not think twice about not calling you tomorrow. And I think it's, it's like a, a matter of slowing down, like you said, and really, you know, checking in. Can I call this person tomorrow? Am I going to call this person tomorrow? Is this a commitment I can keep? I feel like there's this. Right. If it doesn't matter. Invited, <laughs> yeah, people think it doesn't matter. It does matter. It all matters. Right. right. Well, there's, well, let's go to the, let me see if there's, you know, any, anything else about for realness. Um, obviously, authenticity is a part, you know, would be another dimension of for realness is, you know, someone where maybe it's not a, a impetuous mood kind of a thing, but that you don't know if they're trying to manipulate how you see them or they, they're so self-manipulated you know, that they only show up a certain way and they're not actually genuine. Right. You know, you and they're can't not even feel conscious they're... where they're not genuine. Right. And there's so many different levels to this because I, I know people who are super authentic and know themselves really well and yet aren't authentic about keeping their commitments or keeping their words. They're not relationally authentic. You know, they're authentic right. to themselves. Right. Well, I think if, if we look at it from, so, so there's, so there's that, that quality as well. Um, a lot of it comes to self-knowledge because there's also people where they mean well, they have good intentions, but they have no capacity to back up what they've actually promised or what they've, you know, let implicitly led you to believe that they were capable of. In which case those intentions are irrelevant and can cause chaos and havoc and, and can really mess with people's lives. Right, right. Because you, you, you think... Oh yeah, this person's going to be this kind of a friend or whatever it is, and they actually don't know themselves well enough that they they don't realize that they really aren't that. Right. And it's then so you you base your life on the fact that you think it's going to be a certain way with them, and you misconstrue. You know, you now kind of have to readjust because they're not like that. You know, you right. can't count on them. I I have such appreciation for when I'm interacting with someone and inviting a commitment, and they know themselves well enough to say no, like. I'm not going to commit to not being late again because I know myself and I know my pattern is that I'm often late. So yeah. I'm not, you yeah. know, I appreciate that honesty. Yeah, definitely. It was interesting. I did that with my son when he was really late. He was seven years old and he wrote one of those really, you know, with the funny handwriting, you know, pathetic letters. Of, it wasn't pathetic. It was, <laughs> he was saying, cause I smoked then and he was going, please mommy, don't smoke. I love you. And I don't want you to die and all this stuff. And it was just like, I mean, what do you do with that? And I said to him, I said, you know, Alex, I really appreciate, you know, that you wrote me this letter. I, I felt horrible. But I said, I knew I wasn't ready to stop smoking. Right. And I said, I will. And I meant it. But I said, I'm not ready to do it yet. And I'm not going to die, you know. And, and I said, and I will tell, totally tell you. And when I do do it, I'll do it. And I did. I, I think it was about like a year later. I let it go. And I never took another puff. You know, it was done. And the key so. of that was, and even with a small child, I don't know how old yeah. he was, but you were more committed to the truth and to being in an honest relationship than not hurting his feelings. Right. And that's a huge piece of it when it comes to human relationship is that we have such a fear of hurting each other's feelings that will completely screw with the truth and with our honest intimacy right. in honor of protecting each other. Well, or looking bad, you know, you have to remember a lot of it has to do with that. You, I mean, what a horrible mother, this seven year old asks her to stop smoking, you know, and I tell him, no, I'm not going to do it yet. You know, you, you don't want to, you want to be the kind of mother that would go, oh, my darling, of course I'll stop. You know, thank you for telling me, but it wasn't, That's you know, That's not, that well, wasn't the truth yet. Real. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I wasn't going to be able to. So, so there's, so part of being for real. Yeah. I mean, is. I think just on a personal level, and then, and then I do want to get into the cultural part of it too, is having, um, we were talking about in that last weekend with the Evolutionary Collective, trust. You know, trust I think is a really big part of being for real. And the elements of trust are that you have integrity, which has to do with that sort of authenticity and transparency and, you know, having good values and, you know, things that, that you are a moral compass that you're being driven by in some way that doesn't depend on whether or not everyone's looking. And then the other element of 
trust is um, having the right intentions. So, you know, if you're you, you, if a person that doesn't know what their intentions are, you can't really feel them for real. I mean, you're not going to trust them. You can right? trust them to be themselves. Like, I can trust a thief to be a thief. Right. Only if you know they're a thief. Right. right. They're not representing themselves as something different. Correct. And then also, yes. And then also, if they're competent. Do you know what I mean, I think competency is a big piece of whether or not somebody's for real. You know, if someone can be effective and say they're going to do something and make it happen, you feel like the realness, you feel like they have substance and something you can count on. If somebody constantly says they, they can do something and they never do it, it feels like a ghost to me. It feels vaporous. Well, it, it feels more misrepresenting. Like, I, I think we all have degrees of competency and incompetency. It doesn't mean that I, I'm not going to be in relationship with you or an engage a project with you. It just means that I'm going to be discerning as to what tasks I'm going to take on, what tasks I'm going to trust right. you with. You know, that's all, for me, that's being for real is being honest with our competency, our incompetency, where, right. you know, where I'm spastic, where I'm great and being completely transparent about those things and having an agreement between us that we can discuss those things in service to the larger piece. Like for right. me, you, that's where authenticity works. Right. But if you keep saying I'm going to do something and then you're endlessly incompetent there, then that would make you not very real. I can see that. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm not seeing my incompetence and I'm not, right. and I know there's no hope for me to improve. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would think those are the things like on a personal level, that the piece that I think is, has, has been really fascinating for me the last five or six years since I was introduced to this notion of, um, you know, a lot of the personal work that, you know, I think most of us have done and, and the people that are listening have done a lot of work on either the past, you know, understanding what kind of patterns and things that happened in your birth and your childhood, et cetera, that, have, that affect the way that you are. And the, the new piece for me was really looking at the cultural patterns that really shape the way you think and what you value and what you think is important and, and whether or not, like as this, you know, for realness, um, whether or not people give and keep their word or that that matters or a certain kind of morality is even present in a culture. You know, there's some places where it's not cool to be moral. Right. I mean, the culture <laughs> that, that I grew up in, I was born in the seventies was post Watergate, post trust in our government, in our leaders. It was the, the divorce boom. So no trust in the stability of family or whatever that commitment was. Right. So I see among, you know, Gen X and Gen Y, there's a lot less accountability for our word, a lot less, um, mm -hmm. a lot more resistance to making commitments because we haven't seen the efficacy of commitment. And right. it's, it's been really soiled and sullied in the world that I've seen. Yeah, we'd be, I mean, so the, they would call that the, you know, postmodern um, culture you know, which is obviously quite different just to distinguish it for a moment from the culture that my parents, you know, that were, uh, my mom was like in her early twenties for world war two, you know, so it was, you know, those guys, you know, the, the Ronald Reagan era. Right. And, um, like, like when Eisenhower was the president, when I was a very little girl and, you know, Kennedy was shot when I was 11 or 12, something like that. So those are the, you know, we still believed in, our leaders and, you know, we went to church on Sundays and had dinner at the dining room table and, you know, at six o'clock every night, we all sat down and my dad carved things and served. And, you know, there was this sense of stability, you know, insane kind of stability that you didn't even question. Right. And in our particular family, not that there weren't dysfunctional people, you know, everywhere all the time for all ages <laughs> throughout time, but, you know, they happened to also be very, um, you know, kept their word and the lawn was mowed and, you know, things were orderly and sane. There was a, there was a huge amount of, of reliability and sanity that you could count on. They, they, I, divorce, I mean, here's the crazy thing. When I was a kid, we moved once. And when we moved the, sec the first time ever, um, there was a, my best friend 
who her mother was a divorcee and she was the only person in the town that, that I knew. You just thought when people grow up, they're married and, you know, they have a certain amount of money and they're like, okay. Yeah. And in my world, it's like your parents are married. It's such a bizarre <laughs> anomaly that's almost impossible to wrap our minds around. Yeah. And so, so it's you completely, can that. It's huge. It's completely yeah. huge. And as well, like not growing up with an Eisenhower, not seeing honorability as far as leadership or success. It's, it's such a different culture. Those like quality of character isn't rewarded in our culture. It's not lauded. It's not even encouraged. You know, right. it's how rich are you and how hot are you? And these are the things that elevate people to deity status in this weird, weird <laughs> culture that we're, we're living in now. So, yeah. you know, to have, and we talked about this earlier, like mother Teresa dying, you know, within days of princess Diana and how the world reacted to that, to like the death of a saint and the death of a Versace clad princess. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting. So just to, just to keep that distinguished because you'd hear it in us, you know, it's kind of like this worldview of a different worldview of there's order and, and, you know, and the downside was people would stay married when maybe it didn't serve everyone that was involved. Um, people didn't always question their lives. So they would stay on a certain track till death, you know, that may or may not have made any sense. And then, you know, during that, during that time, you know, people like um, Betty Friedan, you know, is going, wait a second, you know, why am I not happy in suburbia with my family? And like, you know, it's like, what's wrong with me that this isn't working for me? And things started to, to change. So it, it was the feminist <clears throat> movement that had a huge impact on the breakdown of the nuclear family and the divorce yeah. boom that and combined with the the transformation and human development movement that began in the late 60s, early 70s, like it really changed our focus, our focus to what's going to make me happy for myself, not yeah. how can I sacrifice for the larger unit. Absolutely. So that's part of like what we're distinguishing is like it went from a traditional culture to this more postmodern culture, which we'll keep, we'll keep distinguishing. Um, we're going to take a short break. Um, I'm talking with Danny Katz and we're talking about for realness. And, and in particular, we, we, we're going to keep unpacking um, this quality of the culture that makes being for real not as popular um, and not as conducive. And there's, there's ways that we think and there's ways that we see things and there's certain things that we're overvaluing that's actually displacing our ability to 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 want to have more substance and have more reality and, and actually move to a higher level of culture because there is there is another level beyond the one that we're sort of swimming in at the moment um, that we want to point to as well. So we'll be back very shortly. This is Patricia Albert and um, Hi, I'll see you in about a minute. Patricia Albert and I'm here with Danny Katz and we are talking about for realness. Um, particularly from the angle, which I think will be, you know, new for many of you, of culturally how we're shaped and how at the, at the moment um, in this sort of postmodern world, and we're distinguishing what that is, um, how, you know, there's a certain quality of, you know, kind of going with the flow and, you know, not wanting your freedom interfered with. And, you know, there's different things that we'll, we'll look at that have gotten to be part of what we're swimming in together. So it's not really a personal that, you know, to the degree that we're not for real is a little bit personal, obviously, but it's also a cultural uh, swimming pool that we happen to be swimming in together that, you know, doesn't, doesn't completely work. So we were looking at the difference between uh, the modern, you know, the, the culture prior to this postmodern culture, and we were just speaking about Betty Friedan and the, and the feminist movement um, that obviously began to disturb this nice, stable, you know, Donna Reed kind of household that I know that, that I grew up in. Um, and, you know, obviously evolution moves on, you know, there, there always, there's always the good parts of what's evolving. And then we, we lose some pieces sometimes in the mix and we need to reclaim um, some aspects of those at a higher level later. So the good part of the feminist movement in the sixties, uh, late fifties and sixties, and then was, was to create more freedom for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think with any 
sort of cultural breaking free and then changing it up, you know, it mixes things up, it makes change for the better, and then it runs dry. Like it, it, it moves itself too right. far. And my sense of the feminist movement is it, it just got out of whack as far as like women denying the biological imperative and bringing children up, you know, alone and we can do it all ourselves. And right. like, that's not authentic. Like that's not really, it's, it's not serving anyone. So I feel like that sort of, that's the piece of the femis, feminist movement that would be wise to maybe adjust. And we're seeing that right. as far as our family structures. Right. And I feel like right. it's, it's similar as far as the, the transformational personal development movement. And I feel like right now we're seeing its sort of tail end as far as that total focus inward and that like complete myopic commitment to make oneself happy without being aware of the influence that it's having on others around us. You know, I see it in a lot of people in the yoga realm and the new age realm. Like, do you want to have tea tomorrow? You know, let's see how it flows. And there, like, there's such a reluctance to something right. as simple as like an hour long tea because you know, what if I don't feel like it or what if something better happens? Right. That's really good. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you, so part of the good part moving into it was this, freedom of, I don't have to grow up and just get married and have children, you know, speaking just from a, a straight woman's perspective. Um, so all this multiplicity of family, you know, there's so many ways in which people have families now, um, that happened. And obviously, you know, when my son graduated, uh, high school in 1999, he, I, I was amazed even then, you know, all the girls were winning the science awards and the math awards, and they were like leaving the guys in the dust, basically. And it was, it was, I sort of felt bad for him, but I thought, wow, you know, that's amazing. That is really a very different world than even the one I, you know, when I graduated in 1970, you know, that was a different deal. So, you know, that's all very positive and, and that we have Obama as a president. I mean, back in 1960, you know, a, a black president was, un, was unimaginable. I mean, right. to some people. But I feel like there's, like, it gets dangerous in that area because we focus on these, like, larger mores and stereotypes. Like, we have a black president and women can do X, Y, Z. But it's inauthentic because we're not, we're not looking at, you know, how effective is he as a president. I don't want to get into a whole political thing, but a lot of the times I feel like we're wearing the shell of these larger cultural pieces, like... I'm a woman and I can do it or, you know, I'm a black man and I can be president without really focusing in on, is this exactly right? Is this exactly in alignment? Yeah. I mean, it, it can get too broad. I, well, here's the thing with something starts and it's stuff that wasn't good about the, the, the cultural paradigm before. And then like you were saying, we're at the tail end right. and we want to invite as many people into the next level. Uh, which is called an integral level, actually, of consciousness rather than the postmodern, or they call it post-postmodern, which I think is kind of insane, but I'd call it integral or second tier, is there's a different level that the, the realness comes back online. So it's all been good, and then the, the part that's now breaking down is, you know, the over-focus on our own personal happiness and that we know ourselves through our feelings. Right. And feelings change all the time. You know, that's part of that flakiness of, you know, someone's like, wow, this is amazing. And then poof, it means nothing because their feelings have now taken them someplace else. And that's so the concern of your relatedness and whether or not people see you as credible and whether or not you're having an impact on the world around you is not what you're thinking about. You're thinking cool. about your own happiness and, and that you're following your guidance. Yeah, it, it feels like an overindulgence as far as when it comes to, you know, like the example of not being able to commit to tea. To tea. Well, what if I'm not feeling it, you know? And so we're, right. we're so reliant on these feelings and making ourselves feel good at, in every moment, you know, that sort of addiction right. to that, that right. we're not able to get out of our own way to, yeah. to have different experiences and create larger alliances and have different collaborations. You know, well, part so of it, I mean, so it was good focused. because people couldn't feel themselves before, and now right. it's overdone. So, you exactly. know, now we need to, you know, course correct. Right. Um, which, and the kind of course correction moving into integral, like moving into a place with, that's, that's more comprehensive, is you always expand 
the amount of reality you take in. Okay. So that's what's important is like more reality equals a more integrated approach. So do I need to, to address my own experience and how I feel? Absolutely. Do I need to expand to include that I'm relating to you <laughs> and I have a husband, let's say, or I've got other things and do I, do I, am I a part of the world? Right. So do we do have, have some kind of impact or bandwidth? So you really hold more than just my personal happiness and just my inner guidance. Right. Isn't the whole thing. Right. So the more you expand, then you're, then you're taking on, you're taking responsibility for much more, which is incredibly important. The way that I'm seeing it now that you're saying this is we have this sort of old model, um, you know, sacrificial relationship to like family and order. Right. And that wasn't authentic. So we broke free from that to be more. Well, no, no, no. Ourselves. That was authentic. That was not, not authentic. Well, there that was definitely authentic. But there were plenty of women who were, you know, at home taking care of the house, taking care of the kids, wanting to do more, wanting to express themselves differently while their husbands were out working, having affairs, et cetera, et cetera. And the women, you know, everyone was sort of swallowing the truth in service of the family unit back right. then, right? Earlier in the 20th but century. But I wouldn't say it's not authentic. It's like, you know, that's genuine. That was a genuine, that was a reality of that time. Just like that in the was Middle the reality ages. of that time. Right. It's, exactly. it's not, yeah. But then we evolved into the transformational world and personal development and people finding their own happiness for themselves. And I feel like now we're, we're sort of moving to the end of that where we'd be wise to come into greater realms of accountability with one another so that we could come together again for larger purposes in Definitely. a more effective way. Yeah. So, I mean, the moving to the next level is you don't let go of the things before. You, you sort of reintegrate them and you expand your, your sense of reality. Exactly. Um, so, you know, Another I mean... The, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say another cultural piece, which I think is huge as far as, you know, the different generations is that my generation, uh, we, were, we were still under the illusion that you get good grades, you go to college, you get a degree, and you're going to get a good job, and your life is going to be fine. Right. That, that doesn't exist anymore. Like generation Y didn't have that illusion to go on, which I think is another piece of um, that lack of for realness as far as like doing what we say we're going to do. Right. Because that didn't work out for my generation. Right. And I think the later generations are seeing that. So they're like, I don't want to play that game. Right. Well, and it doesn't work anyway. So why should I? Yeah. What's the point? So, th so there's like a jadedness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. What, what actually gives people all of the strength, you know, the, like an integrated level of strength, and it would be for young people as well, is you need the, the good elements of all the, the cultural strengths of each kind of level as it unfolded. So the strength that my parents had, you know, that, that, that level of, of, you know, sort of more conventional way of being, of being able to have uh, integrity, you know, as far as knowing that there's a right way and a wrong way and there's, you know, they could be counted on over time and there's a certain level of stability and order um, and being able to sacrifice yourself for, for a higher ideal, you ha still have to have that. You right. know, that muscle still works on planet Earth and it still works in people. It's, it's quite a beautiful, um, it's beautiful when people have that strongly. It's like being it's a good Boy Scout think, or something. I think we're we're... Suffering is a bit of a strong word, but we're taking a hit because so many of us haven't seen that. You, yeah. You grew up with those models. We don't, we don't have those models. Yeah. So there's muscles there. It's almost like there was a point where I thought, like my son loves summer camp. You know, summer camp was probably as close as he got to that kind of structure. You know, you get up at six, you know, 7 a.m. It's Reveille. You know, you have to go eat your breakfast. You know, there's a certain kind of that structure that's reliable, that feels, you know, that feels good to the soul. It actually, you know, feels good to have that. So, you know, young people, people my age and older still need that. And if it's missing in, in a human being, you still need to find out well, what, what would that look like? And how could I actually become more credible there? 
um, the sensitivity, you know, being productive, you know, the, one of the next levels was, you know, being able to be really effective and productive in the world. You know, we've seen the, the bad side of that, which is the industrialization of the planet and not being concerned with, you know, growing and more and more and better. You know, when I was speaking with Charles Eisenstein last time, you know, it was pretty clear where that went. But you still, within, within reason, you need to be able to be somebody who's producing effectively, you know, knows how to be effective. And there's so many people, you know, and I've seen a lot of young people that are just, they're not any good at getting things done or, you know, being successful, actually. Well, I think a lot of it is that it's, it's a reaction. Like they don't want to, it's gotten such a bad rap. Bad press, right. So much corruption and, and it's been so misappropriated, these powers and these technologies that, you know, a lot of people are still reacting and pushing it away. And it's harder to see what's good in it and what will serve because the bad is so big and so loud and so destructive. Yeah. And and with everything, you always have to distinguish there's a positive and there's a negative, you know, there's, there's an enlightened version of something and there's a negative version of something in all things. Right. What serves And we just get confused. We just kind of like go, Ooh, it's all bad, you know? And then we just, throw it in the garbage. You know I mean? It's the easier. Fact that, Extremes well, it's are easier. easier than finding the gray. Right. And, and, you know, the fact that the industrialized, you know, what we did and where we brought humanity from, from, you know, like all kinds of things. I mean, the world is a much better place because we've done all that. Now it, we, we took it too far. <laughs> so that needs to like come back, but there's just, there's a huge amount of the progress that we've made. That's, that's raised, you know, hu- human life in a huge way. So, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, we don't want to like go back to, you know, agrarian life or something. Um, so there's that. So if people are missing that part and, or they're averse to it, they might need to find a more friendly relationship to their own personal success and achievement. Um, I, I mean, I think that goes perfect. back to, to positive models, you know, like, it's so easy and we have a cultural habit of complaining and talking about what sucks and what isn't working. And we very rarely talk about what is working, what is serving and what's great and what we're appreciative for. Right. Certainly the media isn't giving us that. So it takes more attention and effort to choose to see those things, you know, that aren't, they're just not as apparent. Yeah, it's true. The good version. So there's that. And then, then in this feeling yourself and, and being more inclusive of other people and being more sensitive, which is, you know, the postmodern part of it and being happy and wanting to do something that is fulfilling and, you know, we want you to be happy and all that part, which is really good. You also need to include that, but that's not the end point. Well, and at the same time, there is an absolute human addiction to comfort and happiness. And like, you know, it takes will and effort and courage to not be enslaved to comfort and happiness in service to our growth. Right. And in service to, you know, higher pathways and higher well, knowledge. And, and in spiritual, you know, in, in the spiritual realm, you know, they, they warn you basically, mm-hmm. you know, of there's an, it's through the middle. I mean, it's not just being in bliss. It's somewhere it's, and it's not about suffering. It's something in the middle. And it goes more towards the truth. I mean, that actually leads you through the straight and narrow instead of getting lost in all this other stuff. Because some of the spiritual work has, has turned into, you know, some version of the ego's desire just to be in, just for pleasure. Completely. Completely. Period. You know, avoid pain, seek pleasure. Avoid pain, seek pleasure. I mean, amoebas do that. You know, I mean, there's nothing enlightened. That's what the ego does is avoid pain, seek pleasure, avoid pain, seek pleasure. So then you go to retreats and you do your get massages and you know, there's nothing wrong with all of that. That's it's lovely, but there's something in the middle that's, that is larger. And that's what we're pointing to. That's also the big piece that I see in the spiritual communities and the more progressive cultures is that you know, that sort of languaging around it's all good and everything's great. And, you know, I have, there's certain people in my life, I'll see, hey, how are you? I'm having the best day ever. So it's not real. And there's, for me, I see it as a way to avoid intimacy. You know, a lot of the languaging around that 
and avoiding that reality of shadows are real. Actually, not every day is the best day ever. Sure, mm -hmm. on some level, multidimensionally, multidimensionally, everything's great and perfect, but I feel crummy in this moment. You know, there's that reality I find, that reality of communication and engagement I find missing and I find myself longing for in spiritual communities. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and an over-positivity, you know, that you have to um, be, what is this, kind of PC, you know, to accept everything and accept everyone. And, you know, even if people are, like we were, we were speaking about this, this postmodern culture to the extreme, you know, to the negative extreme, it's, ex it's very um, well, even more than America, you know, in Northern uh, Europe, it's even stronger in its complete expression. And um, we were talking about that, that they actually had an issue with the pedophiles in Holland because they were, they were demonstrating because they wanted to have the right to meet because everybody else gets to do what they want. You know, everybody should have their place in the sun. And it's just, to, you know, to my mind, that's just insane. You know, it's like, I don't think that's all good. I think they shouldn't be allowed to meet. Um, yeah, anyway, I think so it's, a, it's a perversion of that mindset. Like, yes, on some level, everything is perfect and everything works out the way it's supposed to. But in this third dimension, things suck. Things aren't fair. P pedophiles are actually hurting other people. And right. it's not a good idea for them to lobby for more rights. Like, right. that's the reality. Yeah. So... Um, we're going to take one more, another break, and then I'll be back with Danny Katz, and we'll be talking some more about the cultural implications of uh, being for real. Hi, welcome back. It's Patricia Albert and Danny Katz, and we're speaking about, you know, being for real and increasing, you know, that for each other in ourselves and in our relationships and, and hopefully in our culture. So... We we're speaking about, you know, one of the things that, that I think is a sort of a, a key takeaway is you always, evolution always depends on taking what came before, the good qualities of what has developed before, and integrating it and then expanding to include more reality so that you actually are more responsible and you have more perspective. And the, the being for real has to do with now, you know, I mean, Dan, Danny, you were saying that, uh, you know, you grew up in a culture where, you know, divorce and, you know, the, the government and there's so many things just had no, there wasn't anything inspiring about the, you know, the, the integrity that you saw there, you know, the authority was falling apart and systems are breaking down and marriages and, you know, it's just kind of like school and, you know, the various things no longer look like it was the answer. Right. And that's hard. You know, it's hard then to just not want to just throw down your, you know, throw plates down and break them right. and just go screw it, you know. And on every, like literally on every level, you know, we had yeah. like the thalidomide issue. So all of a sudden we couldn't trust our food. We couldn't trust our medicine. We couldn't, yeah. you know, like on every level we grew up with no models of integrity and yeah, trustworthiness. Right. So, you know, that taking that into consideration, um, you know, then it's like you have to see that there is a possibility that instead of that there's no possibility that there actually is, you know, a small movement of people. There's about 5% of the planet that's trying to push the edge to like an, a, a more, a wider perspective, right? Well, Which well, then, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, it, it retakes in. So, so, you know, you've gotten your freedom. You know, I know for me, you know, I've, I, definitely experienced lots of pleasure and having, you know, used to get massages every week and, you know, do various things, you know, and there's a point where even that becomes like, whatever, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice. Um, and I, I, I'm, you know, I think there's many people in our culture that are, that are so privileged, you know, to have had good education and travel and, you know, you can do a lot of the things that um, people couldn't do 50 years ago. But then you're just like, is this the, you know, that, that Peggy Lee song, you know, is that all there is? <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of is that all there is, I think that's, that's sort of the upside to having grown up in a culture where there is no authenticity, accountability, or integrity, is that it runs itself dry pretty quick, especially because it's just not true. Like, human nature is actually good and honorable, and we want that. So 
I feel like we're maxing out on the untruth of unaccountability and lack of integrity more quickly. I mean, I'm seeing it among my friends where like, we value more and more walking our talk, being true to our word, really holding our commitments. You know, for me growing up with none of that and not valuing any of that or wanting that, now there's nothing more important to me. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely to, 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 that that's happening is a good thing. Um, and that more of it needs to happen. That's part of the conversation, but also for what? So, you know, my parents' generation, they might surrender to uh, the cultural norm of marriage or, you know, fighting the, the, you know, obviously the war that would end all wars. You know, there's been two of those. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that was pretty amazing. And those are great people. But what do we surrender to now? Do you know, well, what is the larger? Well, just the larger idea of besides my personal happiness, besides that I know myself besides that I can be personally successful or effective and I'm doing my best to do that. Um, and I want to relate to people. Well, you know what, why am I here? And I think it goes back to what you were saying with, as we evolve, we are able to take in greater and more amounts of reality, right. And expand that bandwidth. So I think now it's much more cosmocentric, you know, like for, for my peers and for myself, it's for humanity. It's for the planet. It's for the universe, the multiverse. You know, it's for evolution. Right. It's, it's much larger in scope than just ourselves or the next generation. Well, the navigating thing, so there's something to navigate by in each culture. You know, so with the blue, you know, with the, with the level that my parents were at, you know, you, you're kind of listening for society or for your religion. You know, like what would God want you to do? You know, what would you do for your country? you know, is what, what you navigate by, um, with our, with this most, with the most current generation, it's more, what do I, what makes me happy <laughs> and how do I feel? And what's my guidance, you know, depending on how spiritual you are, then you have like your guidance that's telling you, you know, so if, if that's how to the navigate. case, then do you see it getting smaller? No, no, no. Then there's the next one. Okay. Right. So then the next one is, you know, if people want to know, well, then how would I, what, what would I be listening to? So if I'm not listening to my feelings and my intuition only, how do I orient myself? You know, where's the, where's the compass? And the compass is uh, part of what you said was in cosmos in being cosmocentric is you listen for, there's a, there's an impulse. There's an evolutionary impulse, which is this dynamic energy that gives life to things. So there's this intense, beautiful, life-giving energy that when you listen, you know, and it's a larger thing than, you know, a two second conversation, mm -hmm. but when you learn how to listen to that, it's a bigger, you're listening to the bigger reality. So it's not just your own intuition, not that that's not in there, but you're like listening to, it's like, instead of like a, you know, I, I think of like, a, a, what do you call it? Um, a faucet, you know, there's some little thing of water coming down. That would be your personal intuition and your sense of something. This is like a huge waterfall. So you're listening to a much greater download of energy and something that you're a part of. And that sense of being interconnected comes back online. Your sense of your relationships, not just being some cultural thing where, you know, I need to behave properly with you. Otherwise I'm going to be excommunicated from society, which you know, was true like in the Victorian era. It's more that you and I are a part of something. You and I are each other in a certain way. We're different expressions. And so by staying connected to you, I'm staying connected to this larger guidance. Yeah. I, to do that requires authenticity. It's not right. possible to relate honestly, you know, a to another in a real way and B to this larger evolutionary impulse if we're full of crap. Yeah, it's true. And I, you know what? I just got the image when you were saying that. It's interesting. It's like, instead of being a solo player, like you're in an orchestra, right? And, or you're in a jazz, a big jazz company. And so you, you, you're being played together. So you have to sort of 
you know, be paying really good attention. You have to be really good at the violin or whatever it is that you're playing. But then you've got to be like tracking and feeling all the other musicians. And because that's interesting in saying that because, and I, we've talked about this a million times, that the next wave for human evolution is the collective, mm -hmm. is, is that's inviting us to step into greater realms of authenticity and accountability because it's requiring us to do this together. Yeah, totally. We have to totally. have those skills. And it and it's this connection, and obviously it's happening through people are listening to us, um, you know, live on the show, and people will be downloading it later, and you know, there's just this ridiculous amount of connectivity that we live from our computers and you know our iPads and phones and all the rest of it, and we're connected to everybody all the time at any moment. Right. So obviously it's saying that you know it's saying that the next the next edge, this next five percent of people that are sort of pushing the edge, it's not just in this connectivity that, that everybody's, you know, getting involved in, but in your consciousness, expanding beyond your own personal happiness, expanding beyond. So then the, the flake factor goes away. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's interesting in how this technology, which so many, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And, and then we have Luddites, you know, like myself who resist and people who right. take issue with it. And yet the reality is, is it is linking us up in a very concrete way physically, neurologically, consciously, and it's requiring that we really learn how to do it with integrity and to do it right because it's so that connectivity is so undeniable and inescapable right now. And the young people, because I watched my son and he's Gen, whatever it is, Gen Y. Y. So he's, you know, he's 30. So like his age and younger, he was on the computer at two. <laughs> so my mistake. Okay. But, um, you know, he's lived in that connectivity and my experience was watching him and watching his friends. Cause th those are the, you know, that's as young as I've, I've been able to stay really close to, you know, having a real direct experience is they were wired for this. Right. So I didn't know at the time I was just watching like his, like he and his friends and there's like this whole collective way he is. That's really different than the way I was as a kid. And I thought, these guys are actually wired for this, only they don't see the possibility necessarily. Right. And they need to see the excitement of the fact that they are, they are the new humanity. I mean, they actually are better, going to be way better at this than us baby boomers, right? Or even the people your age, right? You know, the ones that are even younger have some kind of opening, to this, this 5%, except if they don't get the, the other pieces that are missing. Well, I think that goes back to what you were saying about integrating everything from before. We don't throw it out. We right. integrate it and use it for our benefit. And it, it feels to me like that's the missing piece is, yeah. you know, that rejection of those older values when they, they really have a lot of, of benefit and can serve right. us. And I do think, I mean, we're, we're almost um, to our time, but, but I, do, I do feel that some of the new educational systems and parenting and different things will, if we keep getting this 5%, you know, if we keep pushing and opening up this sort of new, new level of culture, which I'm, you know, all for, <laughs> then we'll know how to take our children through more of these levels and make sure that they're developed fully so that they can they can go way beyond us because they they have a certain potentiality that's not being uh, developed fully because they're not getting the other missing pieces from the other the other levels of culture that they need. So right. So uh, it sounds like what you're saying is 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 acknowledging these opportunities and the differentiations and then creating a structure and a system yeah. to optimize it. So um, so yeah. So there's obviously more to say about that, but you know that is part of what the work that, that we're doing um, and trying to just wake people up to, because when you're on the edge, you know, a lot of it doesn't make sense <laughs> right at the beginning. Um, next week. Um, so, so I want to thank you, uh, Danny, again, for the conversation. And we continue that conversation. Danny and I are friends and we work together. Um, so, and we're very committed, um, very, very committed to, to making it possible for people to realize kind of like there is a new level of culture that we can, we can start to be a part of.
and start to attune ourselves to, which changes everything. It actually changes everything. So next week on May 8th, um, Penny Pierce, who is an internationally respected clairvoyant, empathic, (laughs) I was going to say empathy, but empathic, um, and a pioneer in the field of intuition. She's amazing. She wrote a book, uh, a couple of books, um, but one of them was called Frequency, Frequency, and it's called The Power of Personal Vibration. And she's, I loved in her book, um, some of the things that she is, you know, pointing to and actually teaching people as far as conscious sensitivity and having a more multidimensional capacity um, in our in our in our natural abilities. And for me, um, you know, partly why I'm excited about that and and wanted to have her on the show and to share her with you is that this conscious sensitivity and this this way of attuning, which is different than just paying attention to your intuition. She's got it on a much lar- a, a larger frame. And so I hope that you will join us um, and find out more about conscious sensitivity and frequency. So that's it. And I will see you next week. And thank you so much for either joining us live or for listening to this later. Bye. <laughs>